three. I'm here to I'm here to give just me a little commercial. Everybody is everybody is important. Please respect others as others respect you. Everyone have a voice. So allow them to voice the uh, comments, ask a question, because everybody is important. Reverend Manning is a moderator tonight, and he will direct us when to ask the question and when the question shall be answered. And he will also uh, be the leader of this forum tonight. We thank you for joining in. Please share it at your social media with your family and your friends because this is a very important forum tonight about education and about our children. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Valerie. Um, as Valerie said, um, we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. Uh, this conversation is centered around educational inequity and what that means for uh, this setting in which we're in and the context that we're in and the current situation of New Orleans, Louisiana. But uh, here's what we do, we always do at Justice and Beyond is begin with prayer. And then after prayer, uh, we will uh, just ha have some uh, a few um, background information about Justice and Beyond and our work. And then we'll introduce our panelists tonight that we're very honored to have and to hear uh, their thoughts and wisdom and, and share their expertise and, and what, how they're working within this area. And then we'll, we'll um, hear from them and, and, and uh, have some answers from them on some pre-written questions that our Justice and Beyond uh, team has put together. And then after that, we will open those questions up to those who are participating on this Zoom call tonight. And so you know of anybody that would benefit from this conversation, and I do believe that so many people would, uh, take the opportunity uh, to copy uh, the, the link or forward them the email and to say, hey, jump on this call, jump on the conversation, hear more about um, if you have concerns about our, our uh, educational system in New Orleans, uh, jump on the call, get some questions answered. This is a wonderful opportunity in which we are so blessed and honored to have the superintendent of of the schools with us, as well as representative from the school board, and rep as well as um, uh, Dr. Joe Bowie, uh, 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 Senator Joe Bowie, who's been working on some issues surrounding this issue as well, too. So get them on the call, let's invite them, and uh, let's move forward. So with that said, uh, we're gonna begin as per usual, as uh, always been our custom at Justice and Beyond, um, that is to come together in this moment of solidarity and to pray together, uh, for those that uh, need comfort and hope and uh, for a system that works for everybody in, in this moment. So if you would just ground yourself uh, wherever you are right now and, and pause in whatever you're doing and take a moment now to join us in prayer as I pray. Oh God, we, we thank you for the opportunity to coalesce together uh, in this space that you have given to us. Uh, on this platform that we are grateful for that served, uh, has served us mightily and wonderfully throughout COVID and continues to do the same now. Uh, God, we, we thank you for those that have joined us who have ears to listen and, and, and uh, wanting uh, a system that works for everyone. Uh, give us uh, the, the ability to uh, ingest and take in and process information that we receive so that if motivated and able, uh, that we would seek change and be a part of that change. Oh God, we do pause now to remember our dear mayor uh, in our prayers tonight um, as uh, this city mourns on the loss of her dear husband, Jason. Uh, we pray for Mayor Latoya Cantrell as well, well her daughter, Anne, and uh, we ask that you would give that entire family as well as Jason's um, uh, father and, and rest of his family um, uh, and, and all the loved ones that are involved, give them peace and comfort and strength to get through these moments uh, and this time. Uh, we ask all of this, oh God, in the name of our almighty God, and I ask it in the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, welcome everybody. My name is Reverend Gregory T. Manning. Uh, I am the pastor of Broadmoor Community Church, where no perfect people are allowed, uh, but I am the co-moderator for Justice and Beyond, uh, working with this incredible team, uh, working to uh, specifically amplify the voices of brown and black people, to utilize black leadership to do that. 
and allies as well to do that and to um, bring uh, information to people so that we might do something about it. Uh, so today the topic is uh, educational inequity uh, within our school system, where it may be and what we can do about it if we do see it. Uh, so I do want to also say that Justice and Beyond has been doing this work for about a decade now, um, and we want to continue to do it. We bring together pillars um, who are people that have signed up to say that I want to be a part of the vision casting and the programming and the planning of Justice and Beyond. And there are people that work very hard behind the scenes and meet weekly to do that. We always could use more and want more. So if you want to be a part of the planning of Justice and Beyond, best way to do that is to jump on a call with us on Tuesdays at noon. Uh, to add your voice to what we're doing. We're still um, al alive and strong and, and going well, and we need your help. And specifically, we need more black and brown voices to be at the table. So if you want to, come join us on Tuesdays at noon on the same link. With that said, I want to just uh, give a word to each one of our uh, participants on tonight uh, and just reiterate what Valerie said moments ago that we operate in this setting uh, with uh, love, uh, respect, and peace. We do believe that we can disagree, uh, but we never disrespect. And so we want to uh, make sure that that's uh, said in this very safe space that we've created. So I want to ask uh, just for a moment for each one of our panelists to give a brief introduction uh, of themselves, and that being brief, meaning about a minute and a half, if that long, if you would, just tell us um, who you are and um, um, uh, why you are coming to the table tonight and what you, what you think that you bring to this conversation. Uh, so I wanna ask Dr. Uh, Avis Williams, if you would please uh, take about 90 seconds to introduce yourself. Absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. I was uh, with you all, um, I guess it's been several months ago now, time is flying, uh, but it is good to be back. And um, you may know that equity, excellence, and joy are my core values. So I never miss an opportunity to speak about any of those and look forward to sharing the work that we're doing as a school district um, around equity. And particularly, I know you've asked questions about um, our schools that have the application process and the equity task force that we recently started. So I look forward to sharing that information and, and just giving some other highlights and updates um, in terms of what's happening with our school system. Um, and again, just really grateful for the opportunity to share and look forward to um, hearing everyone's thoughts as it relates to our children. Because one of the things that I oftentimes say is that they're all of our responsibility. Um, and you know, when we think about the challenges that our young people face, um, I really lean in hard to the fact that the problems aren't theirs to solve. Um, and as adults, we have to lead the way and, and set examples as it relates to what our, our scholars need, our young people need in order to be successful. And I'm grateful to be positioned um, to where I can lead that work. So thank you again for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Dr. Williams, I don't want anybody to forget those three words you mentioned uh, as you began what you were saying. So say those three words again. Equity, excellence, and joy. I love it. Thank you for that. And again, thank you for being available uh, and open to these conversations. Uh, that really means a lot. So thank you for being here. Uh, Senator Joe Boyd, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, uh, Pastor Manning. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Boyd. I represent Senate District 3, which uh, used to be parts of West Jeff Orleans and St. Bernard Pass. With redistricting now, it is more of Orleans than more of St. Bernard Pass. Um, I began in the legislature in 2014 in the House, and uh, I went because I was concerned about what has happened to the Orleans Parish Public Schools. I'll just leave it at that and uh, look forward to uh, the discussion. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Appreciate that. We always appreciate you being here. You are a wonderful friend of Justice and Beyond, and to all of us, and we always appreciate you showing up. Mr. Carlos Zervigan, would you please <laughs> yourself? Definitely. Yeah, I, um, first of all, congratulations to Senator Bowie on Connor's reelection. Uh, everyone knew that there was no point uh, that he is doing a good job and, and, and he comes unopposed and we're grateful to have him back in service for the city and for the state. Uh, so I'm Carlos Luis Zervigan. Uh, I'm a you know, lifelong resident of New Orleans. I come to public education 
at first as a public school graduate, Eleanor McMain, class, uh, class of 1984. Um, all six of my siblings graduated from the New Orleans Public Schools. All six of my children attended New Orleans Public Schools. And uh, my, my grandmother was active in uh, pushing for the integration of the schools. Uh, and my mother ran for the state school board at one point. Um, it's, it's, it's deep in my family. And uh, as then I became a teacher in New Orleans Public Schools for about 10 years in the 90s. And then after Katrina got... Uh, in deep in the rebuilding of the schools to try to make them better than they had been in terms of outcomes for children being the goal to have improvement there. Uh, when uh, my predecessor announced he wouldn't run for re-election to the school board, uh, well, it wasn't my aspiration to be a school board member because it can be difficult and your control is very limited as what you can do. I decided that was my next step of what I had to do. So 30 years into my work with public education in New Orleans, this is where I find myself doing everything I can within my power to have a, as equitable a system as possible, to finally maybe succeed in our promise of, uh, of, of fundamental fairness as a basic civil right that everyone deserves an excellent public education. I'm not sure we're there yet. Uh, so sometimes I do feel a little discouraged or a little fatigued, but I don't stop fighting for what is the ultimate goal is that everyone should have an excellent education, access to that, and a successful life. Uh, that's why I'm here. I always enjoy coming to this group. We're very like-minded in terms of what we're doing and why. I come to do whatever I can to share information with you, to clarify things, to tell you what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing. Um, I'm grateful to be here with Dr. Williams and Dr. Bowie tonight. So thank you for having us. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Zervigan. We very much appreciate you being here and always again showing up. Um, so there are questions that we have pre-written. Um, uh, that is the uh, um, question writing uh, committee of Justice and Beyond. I put together some questions. Uh, I'm going to ask those questions, but some of those will be directed to um, one panelist. Some will be directed to two panelists, and 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 some to all. And uh, and so we're just going to go that way, if you don't mind, and and uh, just flow with that. But my first question is for uh, Dr. Williams. Um, there was a report uh, that you submitted to the uh, to the school board on May the 16th. And um, we, just I would like to know if you would provide us with a PDF of that, be willing to provide us with a PDF of that report. And uh, I don't have it here, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could just summarize uh, what yeah. the findings of the report were. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I, oh. And I did just put the link to it in the chat to the host, um, and I can email it to you um, okay. later as well. Um, but I'm happy to to kind of just walk through what that report was. Um, you know, essentially what I was looking at is the data around our schools with eligibility criteria. Um, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed most about my, my first year was visiting all of our schools and um, seeing great things happening, um, but also listening to the community and to stakeholders. And one of the things that um, I was asked on numerous occasions was about the number of our black and brown children children who are in um, DNF schools compared to white children. Um, and, you know, hearing that enough, um, even hearing it one time was enough, honestly, uh, for me to dig deeper in terms of looking at the data. And so the report that you'll, you'll look at, it, it basically begins by walking through some of the basic eligibility criteria for our schools. Um, and then the report that I shared with the board um, really honed in on our four schools that have eligibility criteria. And that was Audubon, uh, uh, ben Franklin High School, Lake Forest Elementary School, as well as the Willow School. Um, and then I went on to share some um, specific data um, around um, those, spe those specific schools, um, as well as um, from a more broad standpoint, um, you know, what our data says in terms of um, where our students are placed based on school letter grades. Uh, one of the things that was, that was really surprising to me was when I looked at um, each of the schools, um, and I'm gonna use Ben Franklin as an example, um, you know, there were, were over six 
600 black students who had applied for Ben Franklin and over 500 were not eligible. And so when I visited Ben Franklin, I asked um, the school leader, you know, tell me more about that. What does what does eligible mean, um, you know, in terms of what the scholars did or did not do in order to be admitted into the school? And so the first thing was they admit everyone who's eligible at Ben Franklin, which I think is a great thing. Uh, you know, so when he talked about eligibility, he said it's usually not having a score um, that's high enough from an academic standpoint. Um, and of course, we, we, we're in the process of unpacking that for this previous year um, so that we can have some real time data to look at the number of students who applied and so forth. Um, but essentially, the conversation that I had with him is that that's not a high school problem. You know, you can't prepare students for advanced pace placement classes in high school and you can't do that in middle school. So some of the things that I talked about during my report was really looking back and seeing how are we um, exposing our scholars as early as pre-K, kindergarten and first grade to rigorous curriculum. How are we ensuring that our young people have access to um, gifted and talented services? You know, What are we doing to make sure that teachers um, understand how to scaffold the, um, their uh, curriculum standards so that they can infuse use greater um, and more robust um, academic outcomes for for their scholars. And so those those were kind of the drivers for for the work um, of the task force that was ultimately formed and so did uh, form an equity task force and that task force thus far has met two times to begin unpacking um, that this information and really looking at what additional data points are needed uh, for us to be able to make some recommendations. Um, and my expectation will be that we'll be prepared to make recommendations um, about any changes um, at some point during the spring of, of this current school year. Okay. okay. Very good. Can can you tell us who is on that task force? I can. Um, I absolutely can. So the task force, this is now this is an internal task force, and we're also creating um, an equity advisory council that we'll um, start promoting and roll out a little bit later. So these were our internal folks who had the institutional knowledge about their specific schools, about the application process and the enrollment process. Um, so we did have Nicolette London from the Willow School, Dana Henry, who is an education advocate and a parent, Daryl Kilbert um, from Ben Franklin Elementary and Middle School, Candace Robertson is one of our internal team members, uh, Tina Sharif from Ben Franklin High School, Kim Owens from Ben Franklin High School, uh, Steve Corbett from Audubon, Maggie Riddell from our enrollment office, Mardell Early from Lake Forest, Monique Igana from Lake Forest, uh, Yusuf Young, one of our team members, and Samantha Pichon, um, who is our executive director for equity, who is leading this work. And then of course, I'm on the team as well. Um, so this is an internal team that's um, really uh, charged with unpacking what we're currently doing um, and being able to identify um, some areas for us to grow and to improve. So the first meeting, we, we really just kind of level set, you know, how do we we define equity? What does this mean in terms of the work that, that this group is charged to do? And then at the second meeting, we began um, a really unpacking it through a SWOT analysis. So we were looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, as it relates to what's currently happening with our schools that have application criteria. Um, we're looking at how do we address uh, racial disparities um, and um, knowing that there's an urgent need for us to do this because um, our babies can't wait for us to, to figure this out. Um, but we want to really aim to promote more inclusive um, excellence for our school system so that it's not exclusive um, to, to certain groups of students. Um, it's inclusive of all of our students. Um, and then just really um, leaning in on objectives to ensure that, um, that we're looking at the practices that are in place. Um, you know, a couple of things that have already come up through one of our solution circles was even the times and locations for testing. Um, you know, what can we do to streamline that so that that's not a barrier for our families. Um, and then there'll be some deeper dives in talking uh, with our specific families and, and particularly those who have applied for schools and their scholar didn't get in. So um, the work has just begun, um, but I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to examining um, deeper and interrogating the data on a much deeper level as we move forward. Very good. Thank you for, for that description. I want to ask Mr. Jervigan, do you, do you have any comments regarding the task force? 
No, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's been formed. I'm very uh, happy with the participants. The, their years of experience in the New Orleans public schools, when you add it up, it must be more than a century. These are people who know what they're doing, who've been doing it at all levels. Uh, and I appreciate that we're looking at not only maybe uh, entrance and acceptance, but also at retention, which is a whole nother issue, which is just as important once you're in, what's your, uh, the, the criteria for which you remain. Uh, and, and there's hardly a more important issue than this within our schools to understand that the, uh, the opportunities are available to everyone and that we have value added in everything that we do. And that, uh, you know how it is, if you're not very, very intentional about examining your systems, then it's very possible that inequities will creep into your processes and you won't even know it. So you've got to be on it at all times. I'm very happy that we are being intentional, being forward and actively seeking out to fix anything that's going on that we're not happy with. So I'm, I'm very pleased with what's going on. Yeah. Can I add yeah. one thing, Reverend Manning? Please. Um, Please. And this kind of piggybacks on what Mr. Zervagon just said. So um, I have a, a huge network of superintendents across the nation, and um, this is a really common problem um, in terms of how do we have advanced programming and equity in the same space? And so I've got some amazing thought partners that I'm also working with to see how some other districts and other um, urban districts in particular um, are handling this and really looking forward to, to hearing what's happening in some other spaces. Um, you know, I've never worked in a school district that didn't have um, some, some advanced classes or magnet programs and that type of thing where um, you had to qualify for it. And, and, and it's a booger bear, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in terms of being able to do that and maintaining equity. Um, and so we, we are, are all in in terms of trying to unpack this, unravel it to, to get to solutions. Um, and, and one of those um, pieces that we're using is also looking at some effective practices in um, other cities and other urban school districts. I think that's one of the things we often miss is looking at best practices. Mm -hmm. Other parts of our nation of people that are doing it well and making it work is something that we don't do often enough. So I'm so glad to hear that's taking place and, and you know the and i'm wondering is a task force that is doing this kind of deep dive to this magnitude is this unique for our uh, for our school district has this not been done in in recent years as of late uh, you know, I don't know if it's been done for the, I don't think it's been done for this particular purpose. I'll say that. Um, but, you know, since I've been here, we've had some solution circles and we've had some other groups, including the transition team that um, worked with us on um, reimagining a strategic plan. So um, certainly I've got advisory council groups and that type of thing. But to have a focus group doing this, it's not something that I've done since I've been here other than this. And um, I don't have any um, recollection of where it was done in recent years. Oh, very timely. I'm glad to hear that it's happening. Very good. Um, I mean, I, and I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. Let me let me just say this. I'll let, get this last question in before I move into a uh, question for uh, Senator Bowie. Um, one of the things that Justice Amiata has been very focused on and, and, and really concerned about is our uh, uh, lack or um, a failure to create a robust vocational school uh, ed vocational educational um, um, system within the city of New Orleans. And so uh, could you kind of enlighten us as to how many vocational educational programs there are in our charter schools within New Orleans? Absolutely. So um, first off, we call it career and technical education now. Um, okay. And CTE is huge. Um, and when you think about it from a national landscape standpoint, um, and most of our high schools offer um, some varying levels of, of CTE where students can get credentialed um, so that they're ready for the workforce. Um, we also have a number of schools that participate in Jobs for America's Graduates or JAG, which is an international program um, that works um, with uh, high schoolers. And, and it actually starts as early as middle school um, in terms of work workforce development, um, and it's usually done in partnership um, with workforce development organizations and agencies within communities. Um, and I've worked with our state JAG office to make sure that we've got opportunities for our, our high schools to participate. Um, and we had some funding for an additional six to 10 schools. And we did have some that have signed
signed on and I believe their programs won't start until next year because this just happened in the late spring or early part of the summer. Um, but we also have our New Orleans Career Center, which offers a wide variety of career and technical education programming. And of course, it's open to um, students from across our, our school district and um, it's, it's a great program, a great opportunity, um, but obviously all students aren't able to go to that for um, all of the programming that they need. And so that's why we do need programming within our schools as well. One of the things that we're working on is our five-year portfolio plan. And the area of variety is, is one that I'm leaning really heavily into um, so that we can look at how do we expand some of the programming that's in our schools or increase the number of opportunities that our scholars have to engage in uh, workforce development, workforce readiness, career and technical education. Uh, because what we know for sure is that in order for our scholars to be prepared for high skill, high wage, high demand jobs, we have to prepare them in school. And so we have what's known as our portrait of a graduate that our board approved a couple of months ago um, that will be implemented over the course of the next year. And this is basically just a North Star that um, entails um, a variety of um, different concepts and different um, <coughs> knowledge pieces that we expect our scholars to be able to know and do as they matriculate um, through elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and so um, I got that question last night, so I did not get a chance to get exact numbers of schools, but I can certainly um, let you know more details in terms of which schools offer which programming, um, because I've seen everything from culinary arts, you know, business classes, mm -hmm. robotics, and that type of thing in our schools, um, and we'll be glad to share some of the specifics around that and around um, the JAG program, because one of the things, that, again, that we think about uh, with variety is how many of our scholars are getting dual and enrollment opportunities, how many of them are leaving high school with an associate's degree, how many of them are leaving high school with a workforce credential um, that's prepared them to, to move forward with, um, with workforce readiness. And having attended um, all but one graduation this, this um, spring, and it was another, the one I didn't get to attend was at the same time as another one. Um, I, I was able to see firsthand scholars so graduating with their course on day. and talking to scholars who um, were going straight into the workforce or straight into the military because of the credentialing opportunities or the dual enrollment opportunities um, that they had at their high schools. So it's an area of growth to be sure. We need to do more and we can do more, um, but it absolutely exists in our schools. Um, and, and it's something that, that we certainly intend to pay close attention to, to make sure that our scholars are prepared to be successful when they leave us uh, after high school. Very good. Uh, and, and I've learned something. So uh, across the board, is that across the nation or just within Louisiana, that is no longer called vocational education? Yeah, that's across the board everywhere. It's career and technical education or CTE. Um, and it is booming. Um, I mean, it's, it's nationally, it's, it's booming. And we've got so many great opportunities here for our scholars as well. Okay, and and and, and kind of may, and, and I want to don't want to dwell on this, but kind of maybe the the whole framing of that is that it's more embedded in the in in the school and the curriculum rather than maybe creating a whole separate entity that addresses those uh, career and, and technical uh, undertakings. Not, not uh, quite, um, because there's specific classes. Like I can take um, a Microsoft Office class. Um, where I'm, where my end result will be getting a credential in Microsoft Office. You know, I can take a specific class that might be another business concept, or you know, like I, I mentioned, culinary arts. There are some classes in finance. Um, lots of hands-on, and especially at the career center where we've got a full medical um, uh, curriculum there, where you can become a medical assistant, you can become um, an X-ray technician. You know, so a wide variety of different courses that they take. And some of them build on each other um, where you um, can get a continuum of courses that prepare you to be job ready. Um, but either way, the goal is, is for, for students to choose a pathway um, yeah. that, that's aimed at what they want to do, at least initially. Because one of the things that I've seen as, I, as we look at graduates, um, it's, it's oftentimes a springboard into other things. Um, one of the things I love to see is our scholars get credentialed. And I'll use 
the medical field as an example, where you become um, certified as a CNA um, and, and you work your way through college to be an RN, you know, working mm -hmm. as a CNA to become an RN. I've, I've seen many young people do that, but, but having that credential gives them the opportunity to begin working immediately. Um, and oftentimes it is a springboard for students to go to college. Um, and I'm not able to, to keep up with all the questions, but I did see someone ask about the associate's degree. Is it okay if I go ahead and answer that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, when we talk about an associate's degree, um, our scholars have access to community colleges and, and, and universities, um, and um, they can get on a track or a pathway to actually take the courses that's necessary to graduate with an associate's degree. We also have Bard's Early College, that's an, an example. Um, and, you know, so we want to ensure that as many scholars as possible are getting those dual enrollment courses um, because oftentimes it's either uh, uh, very inexpensive compared to um, when they graduate from high school. And then oftentimes, depending on how it's funded, it's at no cost to the students. Um, and so we do want to encourage families to, to seek out those opportunities. Um, and if your school is, is not offering them, you can reach out directly to community colleges, um, but you can also check in with us and we can direct you to where um, those programs might be offered at the school, but um, our high schools are very intentional about making sure that dual enrollment access is part of how they do school. And, and by dual enrollment, that simply means that I'm in high school and I'm in college at the same time. Um, and the end result of that is graduating with college credits and oftentimes, um, or in some cases rather, graduating with a full associate's degree along with a high school diploma. Um, very few things give me as much joy as when students have two graduations in a week or in a day. They graduate this morning with their associate's degree and the next day with their high school diploma. Um, and it's very possible for that to happen when students um, are being prepared to do so. Extraordinary. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. I'm sure that does give a lot of joy. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just move on to, to my next question. And thank you for, that, for breaking that out. And, and I want to just assure, ensure everybody that's participating tonight that we are keeping track of the questions that are in the chat and we'll get back to them as we ask them when that question and answer period uh, arises. Let me ask this directed towards Senator Bowie. Uh, Senator Bowie, um, we know that you have been working on legislation that uh, is centered and focused on uh, control or, or better control over our public school system by our legislature. And we, uh, those who are listening and Justice Amiyah will be very interested in knowing what laws are in place at this moment uh, that allows the legislature to have control over our public school system. Well, let me answer the question you asked, but I also want to just weigh in on uh, the first question you, you asked regarding equity. Uh, regarding legislative law that controls all these parish schools. Uh, the first bill I offered was an attempt to take back our schools from the legislative created uh, 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 recovery school district. Uh, that was when the state had control of our schools. Uh, I then authored a bill and it was counter authored uh, which ultimately became Act 91, which institutionalized uh, all of the things that the charter experimental law was supposed to be doing. So, so basically right now, there's no legislation or legislative law that has control of all these parish schools. Act 91 institutionalized what was supposed to be happening experimentally with our schools, but now they have the ability to do it without any accountability. What mm -hmm. I'd like to do, Pastor, because the discussion is really detoured from the real issue here. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about issues of equity and, and uh, Dr. Davis, who I admire and respect, uh, really has a, a challenge that is almost impossible when you're talking about how do you implement those things? You know, that task force you're talking about, because we are an experimental all charter district, there is no directive that the Orleans Parish School Board nor the superintendent can give to any of those contracted charters. 
they have autonomy to offer any curriculum and do whatever they want to do. The only opportunity that comes up is when those schools are reviewed for renewal or termination of contract. So let me just put in perspective what we're dealing with here in New Orleans. We are the only all charter experimental district in the state and the nation and in the world. We now know after 18 years that this experiment for us is both flawed and failed and I learned recently illegal. And so what we have here is an all charter school district that was supposed to be actually testing to develop best practices. That was the whole purpose of this. I heard you refer to best practices earlier. That was the whole purpose of this experiment. But here's what the state did not do. The state, by way of the Department of Education, Louisiana Department of Ed, did not implement the protocols to ensure that these private contracting charters did what the charter law says. So what we have here after 18 years is flawed in terms of what the charter law said, illegal in terms of what the charter law said, and actually it's failing our kids. And the data clearly says that. When our schools were taken in 2005, 63% of our kids were not performing at grade level. We tested them in, in 2019, 73% wasn't. We did it again in, in 2021, uh, 79%. And in a recent LEAP test, we see that uh, with the exception of two, and I'm talking about high school at this point, uh, every other high school uh, it is not functioning from 64 to some 90% uh, are not functioning at grade level. We're graduating kids who can't read at the sixth grade level. Stanford did a report in 2016, talked about the fact that we have stratified by race and class. We have a dual system here. A few students are being educated. Most of the students are not. Over 50% of our kids are in DNF school. And I can go on and on and on with the condition that this has created for our children and our community. We have no more neighborhood schools. Neighborhood schools are more than brick and mortar, they're a support system. I told them in 2016, when I looked at the number of kids that was out of school and out of work, watch what happens with juvenile crime. That's our number one problem. This is a system that is not working for us. Is it experimental? And uh, unfortunately, it has been institutionalized. And as I said earlier, I admire everything Dr. Davis is doing, but in truth, in truth, uh, there, there can be no directive to any charter to do any of the things that, that she or the board, if they had an inkling to, to change that. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't have a board who really wants their statutory authority back. I offered a bill, a Senate Bill 25, to give our elected school board what every other school board has in this state. Our school board can't testify that they didn't want it back. So we have a serious problem here. We are in more than a crisis and there's no sense of urgency to address what's happening to our children and our community. I'm gonna give you one last thing just to, to, to make sure we have the right context here. The legislative auditor did an audit and released an audit in January of all of the charters in the state of Louisiana. And 34% of, of the state schools out of 69 districts are charter schools. Now of that 34%, 54% of those charters are in Orleans Pass because they have made us all charter. Mm -hmm. The other 20% is in East Baton Rouge. That's 74% of all charter schools in this state. Now here's the demographics that are of those two districts. Majority African-American and some of the poorest kids in the state. So you have an experimental approach where all of a sudden we only do it in two out of 69 districts and the kids happen to be African-American kids. There's, there's something else going on here with this piece. And so let's just be very clear about what we're talking about here. You know, this, this, this theory about what we want to do and so forth can happen because the governance structure were not allowed. We are not a we are not a school system. We are a system of schools. Each of them have their own board. 
They are their own LEA. Money goes directly to them, taxpayers' money. We spent over $8 billion on this failed and flawed experience. That's just what Louisiana taxpayers have spent. We have spent hundreds of billions that federal monies have come in for this piece as well. This is not a piece that is serving our community nor our children well. And we've been doing this, this flawed and failed thing for 18 years and, and there's no discussion about doing something different. So I just wanna be sure that, right. that we, we, we put this thing in context as okay. we talk about what's happening with all these parish schools. I want just for, just for a minute for, for everybody to understand this because I'm sure everybody's ears perked up even if they've heard it before when when you say that this this charter school system is illegal and 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 again express to everybody listening why it is breaking the law. Yes. The the, the charter law says that this that the charter approach is experimental. And what every charter operator, those charter contractors who would desire to participate in the experiment, that is the school district, if when they hire you, when they give you the contract, mm -hmm. you were supposed to identify what is it that you were going to be doing relative to pedagogy, methodology, and anything else. Because the whole idea was to document, collect the data to say, this improves student performance. Mm -hmm. That has not happened. It is not happening. And after 18 years, Rev, the Louisiana Department of Education or anybody else cannot give you one best practice that came out of this experiment. So what we have is a bunch of private contractors basically doing whatever they want with our children. Right. And I discovered, I discovered something that Bessie did uh, as well, you know, whenever a law is passed, you have to promulgate what's known as an administrative rule. Basically, the administrative rule says, this is how you're going to implement this law, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go and look at the charter law, the word experiment is in there six times. When Bessie promulgated the rule to implement the charter law, they took out the word experiment intentionally. And so that's why the charters aren't doing it. That's why the Louisiana Department of Ed wasn't aware of it. It wasn't until 2014 when I got there, when I challenged then John White about what the charter law itself said. And mm -hmm. even as we speak, not one charter school is actually now doing what the charter law says. Oh, wow. wow. It, it, that, that, thank you for breaking that down. It, 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 you, if it's a true experiment then you would put in place do you're required to put in place a metric to measure that and account for it you can't account for it uh because every every school is doing what it wants to without any oversight that would make them uh give that information um, and here's what the law says pastor the law says if you're doing something and it works replicate and duplicate it that was the whole purpose it also says though if you're doing something that does not work identified and stop doing it. Mm. This piece, this all charter district right. is not working for us. And the law did not define that it wanted an all charter district. It was interested in charter experiment, individual schools, not in an entire district. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you just a moment. I want to give um, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mrs. Urbigan, uh, opportunity to, to chime in at this discussion. I uh, don't want to Leave you out of it, uh, Carlos. You, want, you have anything that, that you want to add? Uh, maybe not, not as of yet. I do okay. see that y'all have a question of what control does the school board now have over the charter schools? Right. Uh, I was Dr. Dr. Williams did that question in terms of what what does she uh, what control does she feel that she does have over the charter schools? Um, and maybe you know, maybe maybe both of you can jump in there. You wanted me to, to, to respond? Yeah. Okay, so for, first, let me just say this. I've been an educator for 25 plus years, and the majority of the challenges that I have faced here as an educator have a lot to do with being an urban city, a lot to do with poverty, a lot to do with systemic racism. 
which is not a New Orleans thing or a Louisiana thing. I, I came from Alabama, so I know a little bit about each of those, unfortunately. Um, and so as it relates to uh, my, my role as the superintendent, of course, we are authorizers for charter schools. And there's a space to where we also engage with the leaders and, and really look at any of the systemic approaches that are necessary, like truancy, for example. We've got a, um, a lot of work happening with the city as well as with our schools around chronic absenteeism and putting things in place um, to help support that. The same with mental health. Um, um, the city, along with uh, Children's Hospital and Thrive Kids, are investing $10 million so that we can support mental health and um, ensure that we've got actual mental health um, at a school-based level at the schools within our district. So um, it, it is a different role. Yeah, I came from a traditional background, so absolutely it is a di different role. Um, and absolutely we've got work to do in terms of um, providing our scholars with what they need to be successful. Um, and, and with the jobs that I've had um, in recent years, I've had to work with school boards, work with communities, work with elected officials. Um, and this the power that you speak of, and I'm using air quotes because as a superintendent, I'm not sure what that even means. Um, and I say that even thinking back in my on my previous roles, um, because it's rare that you're in a position to be able to do all that you want or need to do um, for children within your charge. Um, so, um, and I, I definitely um, love to, to hear um, Senator Bowie talk about the historical aspects of this. And one of the things that I, I say often is that I completely understand um, the disdain that the community has for charter schools, um, and especially with how, how we got here um, in the, the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Um, I absolutely understand that. And I also think that we're not always asking the right questions as it relates to uh, what our schools need um, to improve. And again, those questions uh, from my perspective, as the educator boots on the ground, um, have a lot more to do with poverty, uh, systemic racism, and, and those types of issues that urban cities often um, are, are fraught with. I guess, I, I, I mean, I, I hear your response, uh, Dr. Williams, and I understand where you're coming from with that, and, and, and um, mostly agree with, with all of that. In fact, uh, all of what you said, I agree with. Um, what I, I what I want to get to the heart of and what I, I, I think what most people are seeing and, and have trouble with is that, you know, uh, a, as a pastor, I have an ecclesiastical supervisor that uh, has control over what I do. If I get out of line, then I, I got to get back in line because uh, my, my bishop says says so. Um, and so while every church is autonomous, I do have, he does have control over, over what I do. And I guess what we're seeing is that if you give a directive or the school board rather gives a directive or you give a directive to a charter school, um, is, is there a mechanism that says they have to do what you have, have indicated is the um, route to go to uh, uh, redirect or to do something different or to uh, uh, change their programming or curriculum or, or whatever else? Is, is that the kind of control that uh, you have that I think others are 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 um, wanting and desiring to make the system work better. Yeah. So, and I guess I, I would, the short answer is it depends. It depends on what it is because, to your point, um, obviously charter schools are built on the premise of <laughs> autonomy. You know, and I, and part of that autonomy is around curriculum. Uh, but there's also a space where there's accountability to match that. And you know, in my my short time here, there have been a number of opportunities for us to um, weigh in from an accountability standpoint when schools were either doing something um, that didn't align with um, policy, law, contract contractual agreements and that type of thing. So um, the, the short answer is it just depends on what the specific issue is. Um, charter schools have the autonomy to choose their, their curriculum, to hire their own staff, um, and they are responsible for operations and finance within their schools. And that is not something that um, I, I influence unless it does, again, violate something that's um, either policy, law, contractual, that would result in an issue of noncompliance. And, and I'm going to, I promise I'm going to move on for this, but some of, so we, in a recent discussion we had about the charter school system, somebody indicated, they said, well, some charter schools don't even give the students a proper nutritious lunch. And there's no oversight to ensure that that's done when, you know, they're throwing them 
uh, the, something that's just uh, not edible? Uh, and, and what can we do about it? Because the charter school has control over that. In an issue as simple as that, can, can the school board and yourself step in to make that charter school do, do serve something differently? Absolutely not serve something different. Let me say this, as an educator for 25 plus years, the number one complaint I get from students is that they don't like their lunch. <laughs> um, and in and, and, and Selma, we did a whole campaign on improving school lunch. Um, so let me say that first. But if, if, some, if there's a school that's not following federal guidelines, the, school, the child nutrition program is federal law. That's not even sure. um, state and it's not um, local district. And if, if I'm aware of that, then absolutely that will be addressed and it will be corrected. Um, you know, just like any other superintendent, I get emails and phone calls from families um, with some concerns about something that's happening or not happening at their child's school. And anytime it does come to us, we do address it. And, um, and sometimes it's a matter of letting the school know because sometimes the school may not even be aware. And this again, this is not a New Orleans thing as, as superintendent and even as an assistant superintendent and an executive director, I would uh, sometimes have families who would reach out directly to administration and the school would not necessarily necessarily be aware of the problem. But if it's something around um, school lunch and federal law and that type of thing, um, or any other thing, actually, if it's a complaint, a concern, or a co question that a family member has, if they send it to, to our office or to one of our, our chiefs, then it is something that we address. Um, how it's addressed, you know, it, it depends on, again, what the issue is. Because as I stated, charter schools have autonomy to choose their curriculum, their staffing, and um, operational um, functions around finance and so forth. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Zervigan, you wanna add anything to this? Uh, maybe to clarify that uh, if we think about the board and its role, the elected board, the superintendent and the superintendent's role, uh, what's happened here is impacted the authority of those two differently. I would suggest that a elected school board best not be telling the superintendent directly how to run schools that I should not be interfering with the superintendent and telling her how to run schools under her charge. We hired her to do that. And then we we're overseeing her performance and the outcomes. So the fact that I'm not able to directly, you know, do things to schools, is, is, it's like it would be anyway. The gigantic change was for the superintendent's office. The superintendent no longer directly runs and administers schools. The superintendent's not choosing curriculum, not choosing principals or anything like that. The superintendent, therefore, is in the uh, the, the accountability role and the portfolio planning, finan over uh, financial oversight, and so forth. So that's where the big change occurred. And that's you know, just to help us guide our discussion about what's going on, what everybody's roles are. And I say that because the question asked, um, you know, what uh, role, what control does the school board now have over the schools? And I think that uh, it's a much more important question to ask what control does the superintendent have, which the superintendent has just elaborated on quite well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Pastor, Mr. Let me, let, 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 can I weigh in on that for some minute? Please. Yes. If, 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 if this experimental approach was so great, why is it that only two districts pretty much have 74% of these experimental charters? <laughs> Every other school, the 67 other school districts run traditional schools, have a traditional governance structure. You heard, you heard uh, uh, the superintendent say that our board is now an authorizer or authorizers. Authorizers. Basically, then you just then identify who's going to get a contract. That's it. That's they, they have they have when I say they I mean the state has reduced our democracy the New Orleans democracy basically is an insult because they say we can't govern ourselves now we elect school board members they have no no power authority at all based on what the statutory and constitution gives to elected school board they can't do anything and 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 while they say they can do this and do that and the other they can't do anything. They can only request, but that's not happening anywhere else in the state. And see, what really irks me, Pastor, is that for 18 years, our children are the victims of this failed and flawed approach. 
And so while we talk about what we're going to do and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, every day our children are both the victim and the perpetrators of homicides and fratricides. They can't write because cursive writing is taken out. They can't read. We're graduating kids who can't read. This is only happening in this city in particular. There's nowhere else this all charter district experiment is happening. And no one, including our school board, and of course, Dr. Williams just came. So, and, and I've spoken with her, we've talked. She is very capable and competent if we give her something to work with. But she, she, she she's trying to juggle something that just won't fit. Mm -hmm. it, it just won't fit. But, but here's the problem. New Orleans cannot go another five years with this failed experimental approach. We will not be able to survive it. We have no more neighborhood schools. Juvenile crime is through the roof. And let's, what else is going to happen? Poverty. Who are we talking about that will be the adult of this city? The children who, who are being uneducated and graduating. This is a piece that we must address that is really for us our civil rights challenge of the 21st century, public education in this city, because it's yeah. only happening in this city out of yeah. 69 school districts. And, and Senator, that is a incredible point that I think that we need to understand that if, if uh, we are to talk about equity, uh, and systems be being uh, uh, lacking equity, then we need to talk about that. Who is this experiment affecting? Who has it been on? Uh, who are we? Who have we subjected to it? Um, to uh, to some very um, terrible results that are going to be long lasting, and it is uh, predominantly, if not all, black and brown children, and that that is that is. Uh, that is a failure in and of itself. So I I, um, I, I got to move on to some questions from uh, our uh, participants. But but first, I want to ask you this, Dr. Bowie. It, I, I'm, mm -hmm. we're, we all always just grateful for your passion, for your work. Um, and, and I just want to, um, before we move on to questions, hear from you. What then is the solution? What what I know that you're you're trying you've been trying to work put on put into place um, some some laws and pass some bills that were give more authority uh, that would change the system. Uh, there are some who just say, you know, throw it out. Um, uh, what, what is the solution that you are proposing? Well, just like Dr. Williams, I also am an educator. And, and here's what I understand about what we have created here. You really cannot quote, get rid of this experimental approach. What we have to do is to realign it to stop the damage. And by that, I mean this, Pastor. For instance, we have over 50% of our kids attending DNF schools. And really, the C school is not really a C because we're working off 150 points as opposed to 100. So when you talk about letter grades, that's a game to make it appear like something good is happening. But here's the fact and the condition. In Senate Bill 25, I wanted to give back the ability of the superintendent and the local school board to decide to do something different with those DNF schools, if they choose to, only mm -hmm. if they choose to. Right now, there is no choice, right? The only, the, the only thing they can do is one, they can say we want to do a direct run school, but the, 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 the thing that's the modus operandi is we give it to another charter or we extend the existing charter. We need something different to happen. If every other school district is running their schools based on a traditional model, and, and there's all kinds of evidence-based approaches we could use, school-based models, community schools, why are we continuing to do this failed piece? I would like to have Dr. Williams and the elected school board have that as an option to be able to do that. So she can work some of those things that she brings to the table, use some of those skill sets that she has, but, but she's trying to work a, 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 a manipulative game here with a governance structure that will have to 
allow her to do something. The board itself is, is basically totally impotent. They, they are a charter authorizing group. That's all they do is decide who gets a charter and who does not and who keeps one. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Um, and, and, and I want to just real briefly, again, before I move to questions, I, I think it's only fair if um, if Dr. Williams or, or uh, uh, Mr. Zerbegon want to respond uh, in any way to that. Um, I'm looking forward to a discussion about uh, SB 25, mm -hmm. which would, I think, be the place for me to explain what I see and how I feel we're doing. Because and, and, uh, I, I, I wanted you to be able to do that now, Carlos. Go ahead. If you want to say a word. Do you want to start with your bill or I could or I could start? I mean. Yeah, you can go ahead. I, I, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it. So the question was. You didn't, you didn't support it. So I, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I didn't oppose it either. I didn't oppose it either. Uh, it has here. Uh, please describe the uh, bill SB 25. That's for Dr. Bowie. Then Mrs. Ervigon, what were or are your objections to the bills uh, and that effort? So. The bill, uh, which was filed without my knowledge or input, I didn't know about it till it hit the floor, right? What it did was it said that on the list of autonomies that a charter school that you cannot infringe upon, it'd be said that you, you shall not infringe upon them, you know, basically a shall leave it alone to a may, may leave it alone. So in that one instance, it would seek to restore our governance authority perhaps over these areas of autonomy. My problem with it is that it did nothing to fully restore our governance authority over enrollment, over transportation, over expulsion, over neighborhood schooling, over the distribution of our district-wide funds. It did nothing to address any of that. And I have had very long conversations with, with, with uh, Senator Bowie, whom I respect very much, who, who endorsed me in my school board race, although maybe he's unhappy with me now, uh, because I felt it doesn't go far enough. I'm the legislative chair for the OPSB. I've been pushing for a full uh, uh, reversal of these things and a full restoration of our government's authority in all these areas. And I see no point in filing a bill for one single thing without even asking me about where it's going to go and how I'm going to respond. So then I'm like, well, this is not the bill I wanted. This is, and I, I, I've tried to have these conversations. And, and uh, uh, I have not been brought into the circle. So what I, and I have told this to all stakeholders. I've told this to New Schools for New Orleans, the Louisiana Public Charter School Association. Everybody knows my position, that I think all these things should be from the shells to the maze, that we may have centralized enrollment, we may have centralized expulsion, et cetera. But especially like uh, the cap on enrollment for neighborhood schools, it's set at 50% in legislation. So my feeling about it, by being left out of it and by having a bill that I think doesn't actually solve our problems to res fully restore our government's authority, it feels like, here we go again. This is what Baton Rouge does to Orleans. They go up there, they have a conversation about us. They don't involve us in it at all. And then I got a lot of you know PTSD from the RSD days. because I've, I've been an OPSB all my life where our schools were taken over. They lowered the threshold, took over 75% of our schools, completely cut us out of the picture. I was always on the OPSB side when we rebuilt our schools here at home. They did all kinds of things to us without our input, without our, with the, they just didn't value us at all. They fired all of our teachers and wouldn't involve us. So we're like, okay, but well then y'all do what you're going to do and we'll rebuild the schools we still have control over. And so I get very, very uh, uh, in, impatient with, the, especially in house that they really go into it all the time, always dictating what's going to happen in Orleans or even just dictating what's going to happen in the classroom generally without involving we educators in the discussion. So um, the bill was going to come up. I, I, I chose neither to support it nor to oppose it. And uh, my feeling is I want to go for the whole thing. And I've been trying to. And, and next session, uh, frankly, I intend to. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank Pastor, you. Let, let, me, let me respond to that. Please. Uh, in the first instance, to hear, to hear Carlos say what he says tells me he really didn't understand the bill. Because that's exactly what the bill did. It gave the school board the ability to deal with any of those autonomy. 
any of them. So what that would mean, for instance, pastor, is let's say there was a, a DRF school. If the superintendent decided, well, okay, as opposed to giving you all of those autonomy, we only want to give you a few. We want to maintain control of these, like transportation, for instance. We're spending millions of dollars on transportation. We could cut the cost if we centralized. But right now, we don't have the ability to do it. So Carlos is totally out the box. Uh, he's totally wrong about what he's saying. The bill did just the opposite. But, but now, since we're being frank, and, and, and if I sound like I am frustrated, I am. I'm frustrated with our school board because I've tried to do an instrument supported by 80% of the New Orleans delegation to give them back what was taken, and that is their constitutional and statutory authority to govern our schools. I did another piece within Act 91 that would change what Act 91 changed from a simple majority to two thirds because they wanted to make it harder to get some things done by the superintendent, right? I said, no, it should be simple majority like everybody else. Carlos, who was over that same committee came to me and said, well, I tell you what, what we want to do is we want to do a resolution to do it. So could you change it and allow us to do it? I said, sure, as long as it gets done. As we speak, Pastor, they never did the resolution. So I don't trust. Not true, but go on. I, 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 oh, that is true. That is true. It, that, that you never even brought the resolution up for a vote. That's not true. Well, <laughs> when well, did you bring it up well, for a vote? We, well, we, we, we voted on it this it, spring. Yes, Reverend Manning. You, you voted on it? Um, it we so, did. Okay. And, and I'd like to make an extremely important point here. I think it's a very, very important point. The senator says he thinks it should be a majority. No, I, I, don't, no I, not, I don't think it should be majority. That's what it was. Act 99 changed it. Tell the truth, man. No, I'm not going to let you lie. I'm not going to let you lie about what's happening to our children. I thought what? I just heard you say you felt it should be simple majority. Now, I, I no, ran. I, re, I wanted to return yeah, it back to simple majority. Yeah, Act 9 made it two thirds. You see, that's another problem. Our school board don't even know the okay, charter. I, 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 no, okay. Now, Okay. They, um, I, I feel like I, Reverend, I'm sorry, I feel like I need to be able to, to finish this point. I really do. Go, um, go ahead, Carlos, and, and then I'm, I'm, I had run on simple, I'd run on simple majority, right? And what I had suggested to the senator was that this decision, again, it needs to be what the elected school board thinks is best. It doesn't need to be what the Senate thinks is best. So the, the so it said okay the bill that that the senator and I got done was it said that the local school board shall make its own rules when voting on, a, on on charter decisions, and then I put it up for a vote. We came up with a timeline trying to protect the parents' right to know, trying to protect the school's right to respond, and everything. It ended up being a supermajority to overturn, a simple majority to approve. I wanted the simple majority to overturn. I did not win the day. But it was the democracy of the local elected school board that made that decision, not the senators in Baton Rouge who made that decision. I think that's the principle by which we need to operate. And, and, and every time I hear, like, you don't understand charter law, I've been working in, I've been working the school system for 30 years. I, I, I've been watching legislation all that time. My, my mother was a legislative, uh, you know, was a legislature uh, uh, lobbyist for the city of New Orleans. I do understand that. I, I don't want to care. I'd leave it there, my, my friend. And, and before I, I still got to go to questions from our participants. Um, but Dr. Williams, did you have anything to say real quickly on this before we move to our participants? I don't. I'm good. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, um, so uh, let me uh, go to um, uh, whoever on my Just and Beyond team is handling and filtering questions from our participants. I'm sure there's quite a few of them. And so, um, <laughs> Is that who would that be? For yes. yes, 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 Pastor Manny. It would be Sylvia and myself. Sylvia is back, y'all. Thank God for that. <laughs> Sylvia. Okay, uh, Sylvia, Hello, everybody. I know. Yes, Hello. we are so excited. Sylvia and I have been tag teaming, but Sylvia, I'm on the outside and I really can't read the chat right now. I'm oh, going inside. First... Can you read the first one, please? Sylvia. Yes, ma'am. I can. Okay. Good evening, everyone. The first question, and I hope I'm saying this right, is that WAP WAP <laughs> is the name? And it, it, the question is, how many teachers are you 
of as of today and what percentage of the teachers in Arlene's parish are certified? Dr. Um, Williams? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, as I talk to school leaders with opening of schools, we have some schools that just started this week. Um, I was at Elon this morning and she's fully staffed, 100% staffed. And um, I know the majority of her teachers are certified, but I honestly don't know um, the percentage. I do know that we're working closely with UNO um, and other colleges and universities to ensure that teachers are certified. And if you're following the law, um, you'll know that the state legislature Legislators are looking at um, some, some differences in terms of what certification looks like up to an including uh, process uh, for starting with an associate's degree. Um, you know, so there's um, still a lot to, to be seen in, in terms of how effective that will be. Um, there's a national teacher shortage. And uh, one of the things that I'm working on is called the Joyful Educator Collaborative to create a sense of belonging and um, support for our teachers. Um, and as one step will be monthly convenings. And as an additional step, we'll be working with elected officials and business leaders to look at things like affordable housing for teachers and look at other structures that we can put in place so that it's not just a matter of attracting teachers, but actually retaining teachers in our community um, because they would be able to afford to live here and feel safe living here. So Amen. lots of reasons why there's a, a, a teacher shortage. When you talk to universities, um, they will tell you that the number of people who are uh, going into education has decreased significantly over the last 15 years. Um, and the pandemic certainly didn't help us any with that. Uh, so we continue to work with our schools on um, processes to, to attract, to get teachers certified. Um, and then another, um, like I said, passion of mine is working with directly with teachers so that we're giving them a reason to stay by creating a sense of community and belonging. Very Thank good. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Dr. Bowie, you want to yes, um, you want to respond to that question as well? Or well, can you? Oh, I definitely can. Uh, okay. I think there's a, a direct correlation, especially in, in Louisiana and all these parish in particular. When you look at the national movement for this experimental uh, charter approach, mm -hmm. it basically dumbed down the teaching profession because we have teachers who can teach now without certification. And just as Dr. Williams said, we even have a law that just passed that will now allow folk with an associate degree now to get a semi-certification and then go in the classroom. The teaching profession is the only profession to date that has been attacked and downgraded and dumbed down. No other profession would even allow it. I'm, I'm really sort of disappointed in the teachers unions and other certified teachers for allowing this to happen Amen. because no, no no lawyers would allow no physicians would no other profession would allow their profession to be dumbed down attacked and teachers are treated horribly we won't give them the right pay for the work they do and, and there's a reason that's happened that that just didn't happen by coincidence mm -hmm. and, and and it just didn't happen uh, 15 to 18 years ago. It started with this national charter movement. That's when we started to get, because here's what's happening. A kid now who goes to college knows that they don't need a teaching degree to teach. So why should they go into education? It makes no sense. They can get a degree in anything. And, and so we have, I mean, this is a systematic approach here to privatize public education. That's why I said what I said before. This is our civil rights issue of the 21st century. And we know, Americans of African descent in particular know, that in a system in a country like ours with systemic exclusions, education is the one way that either personal or systemic racism or prejudiceness cannot impact you. So if we don't take care of the public education system, which is where most of our children are educated, imagine what kind of community we're gonna have in the Amen. next five years. Amen. I know we have questions. Can, can I say one thing, Robert, 
Can okay. we let Mr. Sherva go on answer um, right quick, Pastor? Yeah. Yes. I'd make one observation. I feel like I, I saw this starting in the very beginning of my teaching career in the 90s, and I attach it to the development of Teach for America and the fundamental attitudes that it started with, that uh, that, that teachers were fundamentally uh, uh, ill-equipped, bad people who were incompetent, and so any, any you know, best and brightest didn't need to be certified, just walk into a classroom and teach and didn't need any training whatsoever. And that became, I think, a sort of malignant attitude that infected much of the country's thinking about education. I think that we've turned a corner. I sense that people understand you need certified teachers who are from the community that they serve who will stay in the profession. I think we're, we're seeing more of that value now than we did say 10 years ago. So I'm hopeful that we'll continue going in that direction. Thank you. The next question is, could you give, give specific examples of vocational programs and schools? And, and Sylvia, just to save time, we're going to have just one of our uh, panelists ask the, the question and, and uh, respond to the question, please. Okay, so would it be Dr. Williams? Yeah, um, so I'll, off the top of my head, I'm, and we've got a lot of programs, so I will be happy to give you the full list of every high school and the CTE courses that they offer, um, because we do, again, have everything from dual enrollment to um, career and technical education courses at our high schools. Um, you know, I know Warren Easton has a, a thriving program with a number of different options, as does uh, MAC 35, McMain, um, and I can get some, some specificity. I'd rather get the specifics then um, try to think of that off the top of my head okay uh sylvia also thank you uh, dr williams um miss bernadette has a question she's got to head to work she asked if she could ask that question now <laughs> yes yes miss bernadette uh, maybe she already left miss bernadette you there Um, okay, well, maybe she, she had to get off. I don't know. I looked at a text message uh, just now. Maybe came in a while. Move to the next question. And the next question was already answered in the context. One from VP. The one, no, one from VP. The, the one before that. Okay, well, no, I know that. I'm going on to VP's question. Okay. Um. Is the equity task force pursuing the practice of lessening the dependency on standardized tests to determine admissions to what that is, seller schools and going to lottery um to lottery for admission that includes a much more diverse pool of eligible students? So the, the recommendations won't come about until the, the uh, team has had more opportunity to dig into the data and to look at the process that we currently have. Um, and the lottery might be where we land. Um, it's too early to tell right now. We've only met twice. Um, and um, the initial meeting was really just kind of an orientation for everyone to, to meet and begin the discussion. And so we're very early in the process right now, um, but I certainly look forward to sharing uh, an update later this fall and then um, having the actual recommendations um, in the spring. Um, and, you know, a, a lottery is a way that a lot of school districts handle magnet type programs and competitive type programs. So that might be um, a place that we'll land. So we'll have to see, um, you know, where the work takes us in terms of looking at the data and examining what's happening um, nationally in terms of any effective practices that we see in other districts or states. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Bernadette. Ms. Bernadette. Okay. Yeah. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm, I'll uh, research on uh, Act 438, Dr. Abus, and um, Act 438, I think, was passed in 2021, and they said they're supposed to have a proven reading curriculum with a bunch of other uh, resources for children that can't read or to get children to read from kindergarten to third grade. I presented that to you. I don't see any evidence of that in my grandson's school. And um, Mr. Cass, the, super, uh, the, the president of the union said, you say that y'all don't have the funding for it. Can you explain that to me? 
Yeah, so um, all schools are required to um, have teachers take professional development courses on the science of reading, and all of our schools are engaged in that work. So if you want to email me the specifics of a school that's not doing that, I would be really curious to, to know that. Um, and the funding that we would provide would be for um, specific schools that are within our LEA. Um, otherwise, schools are funding it themselves, um, and they have four different options for the vendors um, that provide the professional development on the science of reading. And that is one of the things that I ask our uh, school leaders, principals, curriculum coaches about when I visit our elementary schools, um, you know, which program that you land on and how is that going? Um, you know, many of them, um, all of their teachers are already either done or completing it. Um, and then some of them are at a different space in terms of um, where they are in the process of completing the courses. Um, and then there's also numeracy coming next. So beginning next year, um, those same teachers will also be uh, required to engage with um, professional learning around numeracy because we know there's a huge gap um, in terms of reading and math um, academic achievement and um, students tend to dip when they get late elementary into middle school in terms of math. So I'm not aware of any school that's not following that law. Um, but again, email me and I will absolutely investigate because. Um, OK, OK, let me tell you the importance of all these parish school board taking back some of the autonomy from these people. Would Y'all will be able to place a proven curriculum like SFA or uh, uh, direct learning and y'all will be able to monitor it if y'all have some type of authority because y'all don't have authority. Y'all, y'all, one mouth you say y'all, y'all can't do things because of a time like down you're telling me to email you. And every time I email you or, or talk to someone in the high position, nothing happens. But I get backlash from the teacher, the principal, the CEO at the school. And, uh, you know, I, I, they retaliate against me, a grandmother that's concerned about her grandchild and the other students in the school. Now, my this state is, law, so if, if I know of a school that's not following state law, then I will absolutely act on that. And I don't recall getting an well, email. Who from monitors you about that, it. Dr. Ed? Who monitors <laughs> that? Who police it? We have an accountability department that polices that, that um, takes those types of complaints, investigates as necessary. And um, if some a school is not in compliance, then it's handled well, through, you, through our portfolio. Can you portfolio. put that in the text message for me uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the chat so I know who to get in touch with? I can put my email address and you can just email me and I'll be happy to uh, look into it and direct you to our portfolio innovation and accountability office. They're the ones. Oh, that I already have that. the email. Address. Is it the uh, same email address that I emailed you in the past? Um, it's Avis underscore Williams at NOLA. Well, just put it in the chat. Yeah, okay. please. Yeah, just put it in the chat. But I have emailed you in the past. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Bird. Thanks, Dr. Manning. Thanks, Dr. Blue. Pastor yes. Manning, we're yes. almost out of time, correct? Yes, we are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, we're almost out of time. We can't take any more questions. Please um, oh. get everybody to give a closing word. But let me let me say this. It's it's often best, Ms. Bernadette, you know, you can copy me on that email uh, just to have accountability, to have other eyes on it uh, or, or, you know, anyone else from Justice and Beyond for that matter. Uh, you know, that is an issue that we are concerned about. So please feel free to do that. I'm asking our panelists if you're willing to put your email address in the chat. So anyone that has further questions, sorry we couldn't get to them, um, that uh, they can directly ask you. With that said, and thank you, Sylvia. Uh, so hey, good to see you. Well, the meeting was changed to 7.30. Oh, okay. Oh, please, 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 mute that phone, please. Mute that phone. Um, let me ask our, our panelists tonight uh, to share with us any closing remarks uh, in, in 60 seconds, if you could, any closing thoughts you want to leave us with. Let me go to Mr. Zervigan first. Uh, I thank you all for a, a robust conversation about something that we all care so much about that I, I frankly dedicated my life to. I think that these kinds of forums to get together and talk about things are absolutely indispensable our ability to to do our jobs and try to do them well and so i think we all owe a debt to you all for the work that you do for the organizing that you can that you maintain and i strongly appreciate the um the invitation the opportunity to be here with you tonight uh and uh, i think it was a good conversation so thank you for having me today thank you carlos appreciate you being here tonight as always uh dr williams 
And same. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, we are going to um, have several meetings uh, in the coming weeks where I'll be sharing our reimagined strategic plan. And this shows the direction that the district is moving in, in terms of our priorities. Uh, we do have four commitments um, within that strategic plan. Those include effective and connected communication, uh, high quality schools, uh, wellness and mental health, as well as operational infrastructure. And during those meetings, I'll be sharing some of the high level goals and touching on some of the strategies that will be involved with us um, meeting those goals over the next five years. It's a five year strategic plan that we'll be rolling out this fall. Um, so please check our, our website and our social media for those, those dates and locations because um, I would love to uh, continue the conversation and okay, um, to awesome. be able to share that information. Thanks again for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. We appreciate you being here tonight and, and for all the work that you're doing. Uh, and, and all the challenges you face and you facing them head on. So thank you again for being willing and availing yourself to us tonight. Um, Dr. Bowie. Thank you, Dr. Manning. I too would like to express uh, my gratitude for Justice and Beyond it. And, and also simply say that uh, it was Justice and Beyond uh, that actually started me on my path. Uh, if you remember uh, years ago, uh, back in 2014, when Reverend Webster and others were uh, a part of Justice and Beyond. That was our number one issue. And that was, that was the piece that got me to the legislature. Uh, you all continue to do uh, the, the work, but be very clear that this piece will make or break our community for the 21st century. And if we do not, if we do not change what is happening with this experimental approach and its impact on our children and our community, uh, I am frightened about what kind of a community we will have. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Uh, Dr. Bowie, please tell us as you move your efforts forward and uh, ad advocate uh, for a better system, a more equitable system, how can those of you, those of us who want to stand with you to support you do that? Yes, I'm, I'm presently working. Thank you so much for that. I'm, work, uh, I'm, I'm actually working with ministers right now uh, to help them understand the crisis we are in, as well as community organizations like Justice and Beyond, as well as continuing to work with Dr. Williams and our school board. Because at the end of the day, the truth is, New Orleans must change what this state has created and what others are trying to institutionalize that are not effective for our community and for our children. So I will offer another, that same law next time, but this time, because I've discovered something else, I'm talking with the NNAACP Legal Defense Fund to see if in fact we can file a suit against the state of Louisiana, as well as working with community folks to do what we must do if the law does not do what needs to happen. And that is we will have to take our schools back ourselves. All right, all right. Thank you for that, those words. Again, I wanna give a, a just a gratitude to each of our panelists tonight for the work that each of you are doing. Uh, we know that you have a love and a passion for our children and we appreciate that. And so with that said, uh, we're going to move to a, just a couple of things. Uh, number one is that I wanna always at Justice and Beyond invite our candidates <coughs> any candidates on the line to uh, share a few thoughts with us about their candidacy and their platform uh, for about um, one one to two minutes if there are any candidates. Are there any candidates uh, that have recently qualified uh, that wanna uh, have it forward this time? All right, not, not seeing any. Uh, one more time, if there are any candidates, there might've been some earlier, but it may have gone. Um, so time in if, if there are any, but if not, um, want to move towards any announcements. Are there any announcements? Anyone want to make us aware of any events uh, that are upcoming that we need to support or attend or be aware of in any way? Any announcements about any upcoming events? Pastor Manning? Yes. Um, this is Lane. I just, I, this is not about an upcoming event, but I didn't want to interrupt at the beginning prayer. I just want to um, offer up at, all our prayers for Clarence Avant and his family and all the um, 
hundreds and hundreds of black musicians um, and black artists and promoters who he supported. He died yesterday um, at the age of 92. He's known as the godfather of black music. And Cheryl and I feel is the recent past uh, director of um, the Legal Defense Fund says he is singularly responsible for helping so many black artists get paid their worth. Mm. So I just want to offer that up, Clarence Avent. We should give thanks for his life. Thank you so much, Elaine, for for calling that to our attention. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor anyone... Man, yeah. one more um, thing: um, we need to offer up some prayers for Mayor Cantrell because her husband passed. So yeah. let's make sure we include that as well. That God give her the strength. Yes, we did. We did that. Opened up in and, the beginning. Okay. Did, yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. And uh, certainly continue to pray for you as well too. Any other announcements? All right, everybody, with that said, then let's close in prayer, as is our custom at Justice and Beyond. Understand that we stand on one accord and together, united in these passions, uh, believing that we can make a better life that is equitable uh, and fair for, for everyone and not just for some. So let me just close us in with that, with that word of prayer. God, we know you to be a just God. We know you're a God that is a God of love and compassion, a God that uh, calls us to uh, protect those that have been uh, mistreated or to protect those that have been underserved. And so, God, we come before you tonight, and I come thanking you for each one on this call tonight. God, you have given us each a platform, each a place, each a part of this world so that we can move in and uh, speak up against those things that are not right. So, God, we pray that in the words of John Lewis that we might make good trouble uh, wherever we're called on to do so. God, we remember the family, Clarence uh, Avant, and God, we ask for peace and comfort for them, that you would strengthen them through uh, this time of grieving in their lives. And God, that help us to celebrate, oh God, that, uh, that his life, God, and the contribution that he has had for our uh, culture bearers and musicians. God, we continue to lift up those in our city uh, that are uh, suffering now because of these extreme heat conditions, especially our elderly God. And the many people that have lost loved ones due to this heat, God, help us to understand the root cause is climate change and do something about it. God, we continue to lift up our mayor, Latoya Cantrell and her family at the loss of her husband. And God, to ask again that you would give especially their dear daughter, Rayanne Peace, the entire family, our mayor, Latoya Peace, and, and, and Jason's family Peace as well to God and comfort them uh, as they uh, go through these next weeks and months. God, go uh, be with us as we go our separate ways now. Use us in extraordinary ways. Show empathy, love, and compassion, each one to another. And uh, bless us uh, as we do that and uh, protect us on our journey. We ask this all in the name of Almighty God and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Amen. God bless everybody. Thank you all. God Amen. bless you. Thank you, panelists. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Amen.